you have a mathematical relation R, the prover and verifier receive a logical input X, the prover has additional secret input W we call the witness, and the prover wants to convince the verifier that there is a witness that satisfies the relation with X, and possibly that she knows the witness. So they exchange messages, and the protocol should reveal nothing further, even to an adversary corrupting the verifier. One way to formalize uh, this property is that the protocol emulates an ideal process in which the prover hands X and the witness to an ideal functionality that outputs X and the relation to the verifier. And any action of an adversary in this ideal process can be simulated in the real. So what if R is a physical property? Suppose the input X is physical, and we have a physical property we call pi. And there's some physical measurement M that verifies X has this property pi. So can the prover convince the verifier without revealing anything else about the input that the property holds? For instance, the physical measurement might reveal more directly. So how do we formalize what zero knowledge means in this case? And for if, what is the witness? Is there a witness? We want to be able to incorporate this into the well-developed frameworks we have for analyzing zero knowledge in the digital context. So this work focuses on a framework for formally defining and modeling and analyzing zero-knowledge protocols that prove inherently physical claims. And we explore two applications. One is to proving that two objects are equal by comparing their radiographs under neutron bombardment. And this extends earlier work by Glazer, Barak, and Goldston from 2012 and uh, more recently published in Nature 2014. And they showed an application to arms control. And we also look at DNA privacy. Can you show that two DNA profiles are the same or different without revealing anything else about the DNA? So there is uh, previous formal work um, on incorporating physical, technique, physical hardware into cryptographic protocols, um, as well as formal work on physical zero-knowledge protocols, but more in the context where the underlying uh, protocol is, is really, the underlying task is logical, and it's the, it's the protocol that's being implemented physically. For instance, in zero-knowledge protocols for Sudoku puzzles, you have a clear mathematical relation R, you have a logical input and a witness, but it's the protocol itself that uses techniques like cutting or playing cards. So, we call this the not inherently physical setting. And the inherent, what is inherently physical? Well, the task should involve something inherently physical, like a, proving a physical property, and it shouldn't be something that can be solved digitally. There is related work in this realm. For instance, distance bounding protocols. Um, one application of that is with uh, keyless uh, car security systems, where passive keyless entry, and you want to prevent a mafia attack where an imposter verifier interacts with your pocket and forwards messages to an imposter prover who might unlock your car as you're walking to the supermarket. Uh, and of course, the uh, generalization position-based cryptography, we saw a paper on that in this uh, conference. The work of GBG12 that I mentioned earlier, and there are various informal examples of zero-knowledge protocols for these kinds of claims um, in the literature. So this talk will focus on the application to DNA privacy, and then I'll say a few words about the framework. So we'll jump right into uh, DNA testing. There are actually many zero-knowledge uh, DNA testing scenarios we could consider, but this is the one we'll look at today. So suppose the police has a crime scene DNA sample we call C, and they want to compare it to a suspect's DNA sample we call S. Should they be able to do it? It's a debatable question. There was actually a Supreme Court case on this a couple of years ago. Uh, so our question is, can the suspect convince the police that the DNA profiles don't match uh, without revealing anything else about the profiles? So first, I'll give a little background on DNA profiling. In forensics, you don't actually look at, compare the entire human genome. You, you look at specific gene regions that contain something called STR sequences. Um, in the United States, there are 13 standard regions you look at. They're called CODIS, but in other countries, it's different. So what is an STR sequence? Well, it's a short nucleotide sequence, such as GATA, that will repeat over and over. And there are certain STRs that are shared by all people in the same regions of the genome, but the exact repetition number is highly variable from person to person. So 
a, a DNA profile is record the length of these STR sequences in, let's say, 13 locations that you've chose, or 11. And uh, that will be the profile for, for the person. And notice that there are two versions of the gene, uh, one from the father, one from the mother. And if they're the same, we call the person homozygotic. And if they're different, we, we call them heterozygotic. So how do you actually measure the length of these sequences? Using something called PCR and DNA primers. Uh, DNA primers are molecules that bind to the DNA molecule in regions that flank the targeted sequence. And when you run this PCR reaction, you actually cut out the region delimited by the primers and amplify that region. So you produce fragments of size n, the length of the sequence, plus some x dependent on what primer you chose. Uh, how do you measure the size of the resulting fragments? One way is using a technology called capillary electrophoresis. Essentially, you pass the fragments through a capillary tube, and, there's a, and you, you label them fluorescently, and there's a laser at the bottom that detects them as they pass by. And, and from the time it takes to reach the laser, you can deduce the size of the fragment. So our parties in the protocol are going to have to have access to these technologies. So we're not going to talk about the suspect as the actual uh, prover, but rather a forensic defender team representing the suspect. So to show that the two DNA samples are different, we employ a very, uh, for our first protocol, a very simple technique, which is essentially the idea of the graph non-isomorphism, a uh, zero-knowledge protocol from, uh, from the digital context. So if they're different, the defender should be able to distinguish between them. The police will randomly select a challenge sample, hand it to the, ver to the defender, and the defender should declare the identity. Uh, if they are the same, the defender should fail with probability one half. But is it actually zero knowledge? What if the police sneaks in a third sample? You have the same problem with the graph non isomorphism with the, with the third graph. But, um, and is it actually sound? And even, uh, an even worse question, what, what if there are differences between uh, S and C that just have to do with contamination in the samples and have nothing to do with the actual profiles? So we're going to try and uh, fix these problems. So what do we do about the police sneaking in different samples? Our suggestion is to use tamper evident seals. So we imagine we have these uh, tamper evident test tube caps, and they're manufactured with some um, serial pattern to be identifiable. And it's important for them to be non-forgeable during the protocol, so the police can't produce replicas, replace the, the caps that are being used uh, without the defender knowing the difference, which is also why we want them to be manufactured with a random serial pattern so that the police can't um, produce replicas before the protocol begins. Um, so the second thing we'll have to have is a joint preparation of the DNA samples so that the defender can ensure that one is taken from S and one is taken from C. And we'll have to do, we want to, the, the second thing we want to do is we want to limit the, the technology that the defender can use to distinguish between the samples. So we run all the PCR reactions and everything in the preparation and during the actual protocol, the defender will only be able to measure the size of the fragments. Um, and in principle, it's not a problem to have a joint preparation because it's only the measurement that reveals information. So the protocol will proceed as follows. The defender places the seals on the, on the test tubes and the police covers them, so now they're indistinguishable. The police will randomly select a challenge sample, hand it to the defender, removes the seal without removing its cover, uses the device to identify the challenge, send only a commitment to the challenge, but before decommitting, should remove the cover on the seal, check that everything is okay, it hasn't been replaced, and uh, if everything is okay, then decommit. And you can repeat this uh, for, to amplify the soundness, you could do it all, in, uh, you could also batch them all in, at once into K-independent samples. So, um, to say the least, the resulting protocol is extremely physically complex. And there are many physical assumptions you need to trust here. And most of all, the verifier, the police, get to handle the samples in private. And you're entirely reliant on this tamper evident functionality to prevent the police from secretly just taking samples of the, of the, of the suspect's DNA. So can we do better? It motivates the construction of what we're going to call public observation protocols. We want the verifier to be only a physical observer in the protocols. He can sit behind a glass screen during the entire protocol and send only instructions to the prover who will carry out anything physical. 
Uh, and it's somewhat of a physical analog to public coin proofs. Uh, in public coin protocols, the verifier's messages consist only of its public coin flips. And so here, there's nothing physically concealed in the verifier's messages. He's only sending instructions to, to a prover who, who, who carries out the, the instructions physically. And this makes a huge difference for physical security. So we're going to construct a publicly observable protocol for DNA inequality. And it's going to use the same kind of ideas that are used to transform uh, private coin protocols into public coin protocols in the digital context. We're going to look at the, the special case uh, where the DNA profiles are homozygotic, meaning there's only one allele in, in each locus tested. And that's because when they're heterozygotic, there are actually some problems introduced. And we handle that uh, in the paper. So the DNA profiles, again, are a vector of gene allele lengths. And uh, let's assume that they're length 13, and each value is somewhere between 0 and n. Uh, when s is not equal to c, OK, the set of possible DNA profile challenges from the private coin protocol is 2 rather than 1. And when you consider the repeated protocol, there are 2, two to the k possible vectors of challenges rather than 1. So if we were all in a logical context, then what we would do is apply a set lower bound protocol to z to the k. The prover would convince the verifier that z to the k is large rather than small. But uh, I've just given you the logical description of z to the k. What, is this, what does this mean physically? How does the prover do a, a, a physical uh, lower bound protocol on this? Uh, so before I tell you what that is, let's just recall the Goldwasser Sipser set lower bound protocol. Um, so you have a t subset of 0, 1 to the n. The prover wants to, to prove that t is large, let's say much larger than 2 to the m for m less than n. We're going to use a pairwise independent hash family. Uh, the verifier selects uniformly a hash function from the family, sends it to the prover. The prover finds a y in the set t, the h of y, such that h of y equals 0, sends y and a certificate showing that it's in the set, and the verifier accepts if these conditions hold. So this has been previously analyzed to have uh, completeness, soundness properties, and even a statistical zero knowledge property. Uh, but the simulation absolutely requires that the verifier is able to sample uniformly t. And that is going to pose a problem for us in the physical case. We'll see. So what is the physical meaning of this set? Well, the defender can first simulate the, the pre can run the preparation phase of the, of the previous protocol. Splitting S and C into k independent pairs of samples, each containing S and C. Run PCR on each, making sure to run the same PCR on S and C in, in each pair. And, and the police can, must observe physically that this is happening. And then to reveal a vector in Z to the k, well, they simulate the choice of the police, you know, choosing one in each pair. And running uh, through the capillary electrophoresis device to, to, re to reveal what the profile of that of the choices. But of course, the problem is uh, you can't uh, do the second step of, of the goldwasser sipser protocol because you can't reveal vectors from z to the k to the police um, without compromising zero knowledge. In fact, they completely reveal what s and c are. So we're going to first transform the set z to the k in a way that preserves its size and such that revealing a single element gives no information. So first, I'll tell you logically what we're going to produce. It's very, very simple. We just take a uniform random vector and add it to everything in z to the k. And so if we're able to do this, believe me for a second, then uh, the size of the set is preserved. So we can apply the goldwasser sipser set lower bound protocol to the set r plus z to the k. And the second step, we can peek and select y from, from this set because a single element from r plus c to the k is completely random in, in n to the 13k, and uh, so this would be simulatable. Uh, so how do, we how do we add r? Well, uh, remember that in the PCR reaction, you use primers, and they produce a fragment of size n plus some value dependent on the primer. So the idea is to select the primers randomly. And so you produce a fragment of size n plus r, some random value between 0 and n. And then you can have the capillary electrophoresis device output the value modulo n. So what will this look like here? The only difference is from, the, from the previous diagram is that it will, the, the defender will choose random primers in each, um, in each, for each pair and uh, run the same PCR reaction on S and C in each pair, as the police is observing. 
and simulate the choice of the police to reveal an element from R plus Z to the K using the capillary electrophoresis devices outputting values modulo n. Now, I want to point out that the police actually don't need to be convinced that the capillary electrophoresis device is, 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 is outputting the correct values because it's only the size of the set that really matters uh, for soundness. So, I'm, in the time that remains, I'm going to say a few words about modeling. Um, whoops. So we translate physical operations to ideal functionalities. And um, we also need to translate the physical state and how the operations affect state. And so the basic idea is that the hybrid protocol, uh, we call, what we call the hybrid protocol, will replace all physical operations with calls to their ideal functionalities. And in essence, this extracts the logical backbone of the protocol. And we want to apply our logical analysis to the hybrid world protocol to say that the hybrid protocol emulates some ideal functionality, which we'll define. Um, and in essence, this captures that up to our physical assumptions, the real protocol has some kind of zero-knowledge property. But we really don't want to overpromise the security guaranteed by this kind of analysis because, well, first of all, you, always, you still have side channel attacks, of course, and they're even more prevalent here because your physical translation from the real protocol to the hybrid protocol could be incomplete. You might not translate every single possible uh, physical operation, and perhaps there's something you can't translate. So a few words about the ideal functionality. So there's actually no witness. The ideal prover is going to transfer access to the input object, the physical input, to the ideal functionality, who's going to perform the verification on its own by querying a measurement oracle for the property and send the output uh, to the ideal verifier. And the full definition will also have to account for cheating. So what are some of the main differences from the standard uh, definition of, of uh, zero knowledge? Well, one, there's no witness. And so the, it, which captures the fact that, the, that in, in, in zero knowledge proofs for physical properties, the asymmetry between the prover and the verifier is an access permission to the physical object and to the measurements that can be applied to the physical object. And so the, the other thing is the ideal functionality is able to perform the verification on its own. Um, normally, the prover is required to supply a witness, and we can't have the, the ideal functionality perform the verification on its own unless it's super polynomial. And uh, though finally, the, we also the verifier can always forcefully cheat in a physical scenario. So one implication of these differences is that UC security is not um, inherently a problem for us because the simulator doesn't need to extract anything from the prover. Normally, you have to have extra things like setup assumptions because the simulator needs to do a straight line extraction of a witness. So there are various other things in our paper. Um, in particular, we have some program checking techniques uh, uh, and that are sort of analogous to program checking from, from digital crypto. Uh, and a full modeling and, and UC security analysis of, of GBG protocol and, and other um, zero knowledge protocols. So in summary, I just want to say that physical cryptography is relevant. It's quite fun. And it really can be made rigorous. It might be much more structured than one would think. We're seeing some connections with known crypto techniques. And while you might not hope to get a, you know, a glory statement like everything that can be done physically can be done with zero knowledge, perhaps you can find other you know, connections. If you have equality, zero knowledge proofs in some set of physical objects, maybe you get something else like inequality or public observation protocols. So there are many foundational questions that remain to be explored. And uh, it also encourages collaboration with other fields. Thank you very much.